I'm Dave Booker, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I want to welcome you to the next installment of our year-long virtual seminar series. The goal of this series is to showcase the great work our college faculty, students, and staff do to address the critical challenges of our time. Today, we will focus on understanding the research and teaching about diversity in the College of Arts and Sciences. The outstanding panel of experts I've assembled today will help us understand this topic from multiple perspectives. Teaching and research about diversity are important missions of our college. And while the discussion we have today is representative of the great work our college does in this area, it is no way it's intended to be comprehensive. For today, I've scheduled eight speakers that I will engage in pairs. Before we get started, I want to let you know that you can ask questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. I want to begin with Dr. Alicia Anderson, Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology. Dr. Anderson, please talk to us about your areas of teaching and research. Uh, thank you, Dean Booker. Um, so first of all, to say um, thank you all for being here and, um, and welcome um, to the series um, and to this discussion about um, diversity in our College of Arts and Sciences. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been at UNO for six years now, came in 2014. Um, and uh, 2014 was the first year for me and also for Angela Brown, who's um, going to speak in a few minutes. Um, and so that was really nice to come in um, together. Um, and we were paired together by the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Angela was my, my grader that first year. Um, and so we struck up a, a good working relationship pretty quickly um, and um, have worked together quite a bit since. Um, so when Angela uh, mentioned that she'd like to write her thesis on Black Lives Matter, I was all in. Um, that's right in my uh, wheelhouse of research interests, uh, which focus on uh, race, media, and politics. Um, and so it just kind of hits all of the, you know, that whole nerve center of what I'm interested in. Um, but I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, I also want to say that Angela and I have collaborated on four different publications um, since we met here at UNO. Um, and that includes um, one that we just found out about today that is being published in the Journal of Refugee Studies. So virtual high five to Ange on that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And um, it also includes um, a Black Lives Matter lecture um, that we had published in the um, American Sociological Association's Teaching Resources and Innovations Library for Sociology. So that's trails for short. Um, and so a little bit about, the, about Angela's thesis. Um, it was impressive. It was impressive to everyone who read it. Um, and, you know, this thing was like solid, like really on par with a lot of dissertations that I've, um, that I've read. Um, and so I really was pushing and maybe poking Angela to um, publish that thesis um, in, in a variety of ways. And I think everyone here knows how that goes when you've done like a big, really large project and you're done with it, you just want to be done. <laughs> and so, um, so we settled on, um, you know, understanding that, you know, even though we don't want to do too much with this thesis right now. Um, it's important information that needs to be out there um, because there was so much detail um, in that thesis. And that's how we kind of come around to um, publishing as a teaching resource so that um, other um, instructors could use it to, um, to teach their students and in other capacities um, about Black Lives Matter. So we set that resource up to be used in courses, but also in lessons and other um, areas on race relations, um, social justice, um, social movements. So there's a lot of background and context um, there, um, as well as the details of the Black Lives Matter movement um, itself. And so I'm gonna turn this over to Angela Brown, who is no longer a student. Um, she finished her master's thesis in 2017. Um, and she went to work for the Women's Center for Advancement for a little bit, but luckily we got her back. And she is now the project and design manager for the Leonard and Shirley Goldstein Center for Human Rights and the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy. Um, she's also a part-time instructor for the Department of Soci Sociology and Anthropology. And as I mentioned, well-published um, and on top of her P's and Q's. So um, I'll turn it over to Ange to, to take it away, um, to talk a little bit more about 
um, her thesis, uh, the research, and Black Lives Matter more broadly. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Um, so I, I do also want to thank um, thank you, Dean Booker, for putting this series together. Um, it's been great. Um, I've I've watched all of them, um, and thank you again, um, Alicia, for making that introduction about our work together, the what we've done, um, and virtual high five on the publication too. Um, okay, so most of my time today will be talking about Black Lives Matter generally, um, but I'd like to give you all some context on why my, um, why I did my thesis research about the movement. Um, and so as there still is today, um, when I was a graduate student here at UNO, there were just blaring discrepancies between what Black Lives Matter or BLM was between individuals versus groups versus institutions. So my research was an attempt to try to slow down and understand the movement for its own sake and actions. So with my research, my goals were to, um, one, to help guide a national conversation on an understanding of BLM as a working movement um, and as a, a rational social and political response, um, and two, to dispute claims that the movement was hateful, which is what um, we still see a lot of today. Um, so at the time, Twitter was, and it still is, a major mode of communication for BLM um, with their handle at Black Lives Matter. Um, and so my research questions were, does Black Lives Matter provide a network that effectively spreads its message? And does Black Lives Matter attempt to foster cognitive liberation? Um, and I don't have time to really get into that very much, but cognitive liberation was a major theory of my work, and it involves how movements encourage individuals to take part in bringing change through their own understanding of a, situa uh, of a situation versus um, just being told to do it by someone else, um, if that makes sense. So my results of my thesis showed that the movement meets the political process model's definition of a social movement, um, despite its differences um, from the civil rights movement that my parents lived through um, in the mid 20th century. And very generally speaking, for time's sake, um, my sample showed that the communications highlighted the inequity in our society, um, offered several solutions to this inequity through demands, um, future aspirations and calls for specific policy changes and uh, made numerous effective calls to action, um, allowing me to see and show how their communication can foster, uh, can offer cognitive liberation. So um, the Black Lives Matter hashtag and subsequent uh, grassroots movement network began as just the hashtag in 2013 um, by three black activist women in response to George Zimmerman's acquittal for shooting and killing 17-year-old Trayvon Martin in Florida the previous year. The indictment received a lot of attention um, nationally and globally because a significant piece of Zimmerman's defense uh, really put Trayvon on trial after his own murder, claiming that his clothing, his language, um, and past behavior justified Zimmerman's suspicion and ultimately his actions. Um, the following year, it was reinvigorated with the murders of Michael Brown in Missouri um, and Eric Garner in New York because there were no charges or even indictments for either of them. Um, and from that, it grew on an initial platform against police brutality on individual and state levels. Um, largely, how the movement operates um, and is known across the world, as many of you know, um, are through direct action of taking physical space. So through protests, rallies, sit-ins, uh, die-ins, et cetera. Um, and the movement carries on, uh, is known to carry on the Black Panther frustration with superficial political change and calling for something deeper. Um, so, one thing is that their leadership really has never had a single one national leader, um, but has more of a multifaceted or decentralized leadership. Um, now, it's really important to know this because it's very intentional choice 
um, and is not necessarily, um, a lot of people had, uh, had criticized calling it a weak mode of leadership, um, and it's not. Um, decentralized leadership has many advantages. Um, for example, it, um, it allows local organizers the ability to lead in their own areas, um, to make quicker decisions, be on your feet as things change around you, um, and keep leadership grounded in individual communities. Um, and BLM does this through um, locally run chapters throughout the U.S. Um, now, uh, donations can be accepted through the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, um, but there's been criticism, uh, especially this year, with where those funds go. Um, so some examples of things that, that have been funded um, are an almost $7 million fund to support grassroots organizations. Um, funds are also being sent to develop curriculum for those uh, new to social movements and our youth. Uh, another project is uh, the hashtag what matter 2020 campaign, which um, is aimed at engaging underrepresented voters and communities with priorities, uh, including racial and economic justice, LGBTQ rights and voter suppression. Um, originally to keep the movement uh, moving in a collective direction, the Black Lives Matter webpage had uh, had 13 guiding principles over time. Um, to kind of give a, a common message to keep with you as you're leading. Um, over time, it evolved to a statement, which for time's sake, I'm not gonna share here, but I encourage you to look on the Black Lives Matter website um, to read more about their mission statement. Um, so one major disadvantage of a decentralized leadership is that there's really not one person to confront all of the criticism, uh, the misinformation, disinformation and accusations. So the movement's reputation, mission and motives are often under attack. Um, disinformation spreads more easily as well that way. Um, so my focus was on the national um, more rather than the local scale. So I can definitely say just from what I've seen over the last few years that the movement and our understanding of it has shifted. Um, for starters, the platform against uh, police brutality that I mentioned offered solutions in the realm of body cameras and police contract reform. Uh, now the movement is leading questions in the U.S. and around the world like, you know, is policing actually keeping us safe? If so, how is it doing that? Um, what does it mean to defund the police or abolish the police? And so that's a big shift. Um, and BLM has uh, also seen a shift from COVID-19. Um, with so many of us at home earlier this year, it was hard to ignore the deaths and trauma um, that happened to Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, George Floyd and their families, um, or even the confrontation between Christian and Amy Cooper in New York. Um, so the movement has made strides, but as I mentioned a minute ago, there's a lot of criticism and a lot of disinformation um, there have been accusations of uh, BLM being a for-profit business, um, trying to start a race war. Um, it's been called a racist organization. Um, there have been doctored images of what uh, look to be Black Lives Matter stickers with harmful messages. Um, because Black Lives Matter as a phrase is not trademarked, um, it has been criticized um, for being too applicable to too many things. Um, and sometimes that can dilute the original message. Um, now, when Alicia and I have, have done teachings on this ourselves, but when we were in classes talking about it, we always made sure that people were encouraged to ask all of their questions. Um, and we always made sure there was time afterwards to address those questions because that's so important. Um, but what I would ask of, of a lot of you today that do have questions is to learn what you can through credible sources and just to be careful of things that you see spread all over the place, things on social media, um, and really try to, to take an under, get uh, motivated to really learn yourself what is going on. Um, so the good news is that there are several studies, um, including one from the Pew Research Center that was published this summer, just a few months ago, that finds that the majority of Americans do support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so while it's easy sometimes to lose sight of angles of, of 
some of many things, um, including a movement amidst the near constant stream of disinformation and conspiracy, um, the message is, is getting through, which is great. Um, and uh, for time's sake with that, uh, I would like to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I'm very excited to hear from the other panelists. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Angela, thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia. I, I do have written down a question, but in the interest of time, I'm going to reserve my question until the end. So now I want to bring in uh, Dr. Christian Donia, the director of UNO's Office of Latino and Latin American Studies. Um, Christian Oyas's mission includes teaching and research, and much of your research in the area of in, kind of engaged, what we call engaged scholarship. Can you discuss these missions for Oyas? Um, sure. Thanks, um, Dean Booker, for the invitations. Um, and thanks to everyone attending this uh, very important webinar. So, um, OIS was founded um, about 17 years ago on the idea that uh, there was a need for community engaged research with the Latino community. And in that um, setting, he has published you know, several um, reports on education, on health, on businesses, on the, uh, the economy, on the demography that have been used uh, by community organizations in their own um, studies in application for grants, but it also, we have partnered with them in doing some of this research. Uh, you have to think that OES is the only specialized unit in the entire University of Nebraska system for Latinos and Latin America. So that's, it's, a, it's a great thing to have it here at UNO and not in other um, campuses um, of the system. And that is, is composed of, of about 27 faculty with very diverse uh, research interests and they all have to do with, uh, or most of them have to do in some way with community engagement. So all these faculty do service learning, um, they do their own research, but they also participate many times uh, in um, OIA's um, research itself. So when I arrived, you know, about three, three and a half years ago, uh, and, and I became OIA's director, um, one of my the ideas was to go out and see what were the silences, or where were the silences. And by silences, I mean um, areas of research where Latinos are not usually represented. And one of the first pieces of research that we've done and we're completing was a um, joint uh, project with Intercultural Senior Center. The Intercultural Senior Center is a, a uh, community organization uh, founded by Carolina Padilla many years ago, who was originally a day center for seniors, for Latino seniors. Now, actually, even more interesting, it has Latino seniors and refugees. And the idea was to actually um, think whether there was specific policies for minorities and specifically for Latinos uh, with regards to uh, seniors. Is there any uh, city or state policies? Very quickly, we can say that there aren't. It's not surprising, um, but there's the assumption that um, all seniors are the same. Uh, and mean by the same, we mean all seniors are non-Hispanic whites and non-minority. So a one policy should be good for everyone. And, and that is simply not correct. It's not true. Um, minorities uh, at all different um, moments of the, of the um, of life stages uh, have different needs, right? Um, that needs to be addressed in this case by policy. So that's one of the community engaged research uh, pieces that we've done recently. We're also looking at presence. How are the Latinos seen by um, by the by, by by the people in Nebraska, and for that we're looking at press. So we gather about four to five thousand articles that were published in the Nebraska press since 2000, and we're actually adding 2020 now um, because of the relevance. So we added um, this four to five thousand articles to actually observe what were the uh, ways that Latinos. Uh, and immigrants were represented. We're still, because there's four to 5,000, we're still dealing with, you know, analyzing that large amount of, of information. But that's something else that we are going to, you know, use to talk, to engage with, um, with the community. 
Um, one of the goals of community engagement, uh, and this is something that we've done with Laura Alexander in a project on refugees, um, is to actually to give back to the community. How do we back in terms of research? So we, before publishing a final report or a paper or anything, we actually go back and present our results to the community, to people that we interview, to those who are interested. We did this as well with another project that we worked um, with um, Dr. Tomas Sanchez a couple of years ago on access to legal aid and those um, among agricultural workers in Nebraska. So we actually tell them, this is what we heard from you. This is what we learned from your uh, interviews. Are we uh, explaining or are we using your words correctly? Right. So we give them the opportunity to actually tell us, you know what, you misunderstood me. If you put that in a research paper or in a report or in a journal article, uh, that's not gonna be my voice. Right. So we give them back in this way. We take the results to them and see in a way that uh, we can, um, they can feel more participant of this, of the research process. The last uh, project that I wanna mention, because there's several that we're working on, is a, a project called Voices of a Pandemic. This is a collaboration with UT Austin and several universities in the country um, that um, is, we're gathering interviews and oral histories of Latinos during the pandemic. Uh, we're here, you know, here, uh, OIS, we've done about seven interviews. We have two more scheduled and hopefully we're gonna continue through the rest of the um, academic year at least. Um, and those interviews are actually gonna be available at uh, Chris Library as a part of the archive of the Chris Library. And again, the idea is that we actually, once we have a larger amount of interviews, you know, hopefully about uh, 10 to 20, um, we go back to the community and actually bring them in and says, look, this is what we got from you. And also these interviews are mostly to Latino community leaders and leaders of community organizations. So they're telling us how this these organizations are actually faring in this current conditions. So we'll be able to tell, us, to tell them, you know, this is what everyone is feeling. And this is what everyone is, is saying. This is how you are reacting, right? Maybe there's a way that we can help you in this, through this. That's another project um, that's part of, it connects to another project that uh, Dean Booker is uh, funding on uh, mobile vulnerable populations that we're working with um, uh, Latinos, immigrants, uh, homeless people, refugees and victims of trafficking. So we're expanding that to community organization working with all those um, groups. And I can stop there, otherwise I'll continue. Yeah, that is incredibly powerful work. I, I guess I, I should have known, but I, I wasn't aware of the, of, the, of the little detail you mentioned about how you take your, your findings back to the community that helped you generate. That's an incredibly powerful moment, I'm sure, when you do that, because it, it really demonstrates to the people you were talking to that, that they have power, that you're, that you're empowering them, that you're giving them a voice, and that they understand that you didn't, you didn't just take their voices and walk away from them and, and, not, and, and not let them know that there was something going on with that. So that, that's, that's, that's just terrific. That's really powerful. So thank you. Um, Dr. Ram Ramon Guerra is an associate professor in the Department of English who teaches re uh, te uh, teaching and research uh, focuses on Latinx literature and ethnic literature testimonials. So uh, Ramon, uh, you're in the English department, so explain uh, the kind of research you do that uh, supports the Office of Latino Latin American Studies and, and um, from your perspective. Sure. Thanks, Dean Booker. And uh, it, it's great to talk after uh, Christian because uh, some of what he's saying there towards the end is obviously work that I'm, I'm very interested in as well. So just in a general sense, I, I focus largely on on U.S. Latino literature, um, primarily post World War II, and I'm looking at you know all kinds of literature from fiction to memoir to uh, you know uh, mixes of autobiographical fiction that that merges the two. Um, but the the research that I began doing in my dissertation project and have kind of extended over time is largely based much more specifically on on oral histories. 
uh, or, or what we sometimes call testimonios, which are uh, very much like what uh, Christian was talking about. These uh, a lot of time take the form of interviews that are then put back into uh, the power or the feedback of the subject. This way, the, the subject themselves uh, takes over the control of the, the narrative and it's not just driven by the questions of the, the interviewer. And so for me, that's become uh, a, the, the impetus for the research that I do. Uh, and I've largely looked at existent oral histories or testimonials. Uh, Christian mentions uh, University of Texas, which has uh, the Voces Project, which is one of the biggest collection of, uh, of Latino uh, oral histories in, in the nation. And so I, I've been down there a couple times and been through those, you know, and, and it's overwhelming the, the types of things. Uh, they, they do a fantastic job of separating out, you know, the subjects, the, the, whether it's, you know, you know, you want to look at veterans or, you know, the, the project began largely as a, uh, a compilation of veterans' voices, U.S. Latino veterans, but then it expanded to include, you know, uh, focus on education, focus on labor, focus on uh, community health and immigration. And so you could really go down and, you know, read and listen and, and look into any particular topic uh, and you'll hear a variety of different U.S. Latinos talking about their experiences with it. And so lately, I've moved, tried to move away from looking at existent uh, testimonials or oral histories, and have begun to collect my own here in Nebraska and and open-ended, not not narrowing in on any particular. Uh, topic that I'm trying to get from them, but more just the open-ended experience. And, uh, you know, in, in any good sort of data collection uh, methodology, I've tried to, to include people of all ages, people of uh, all backgrounds, uh, people who uh, speak Spanish or, uh, or both, or uh, only English or, you know, second generation, all, all kinds trying to mix up the data set and trying to get them to talk about their Latino experience specifically to the United States. And to, I'm sorry, not the United States, specifically to Nebraska uh, and the Midwest. And this has you know, made its way into my research, yes, but also I'm bringing it into the classroom, uh, you know, alongside looking at US Latino fiction of the you know, latter part of the 20th and, and now the 21st centuries and trying to, to uh, connect you know, uh, somebody's oral history, somebody's uh, first person uh, spoken testimony can be, you know, placed right alongside other forms of narrative that we see in literature that might be deemed sometimes more creative, but, but yet deal with a lot of the same things. And, and many times those issues that, that I, I listed off quickly earlier, you know, whether they be uh, immigration, migration, uh, labor issues, um, certainly education. That's, uh, you know, with a lot of young people in the last 30 years or so, uh, education has become a, a, a very, very common and dominant theme uh, amongst uh, younger generations. And then, um, you know, certainly uh, some of the interviews I did post-2016, so they sort of naturally fell into the reactions to that, that election and what that meant. And you know, this was not a probe that I, I put out there at all, but they sort of naturally gravitated there when it was made uh, as an open-ended interview. You know, what, what do they want to talk about? This was very current and very much uh, a dominant part of their lives. So, you know, in addition to what uh, Christiane was saying about engaging with the community, you know, I, I, I also, you know, in addition to teaching English classes, Latino literature classes, I also try to teach uh, the intro to the OYAS uh, class based on humanities as much as I can. And in the past, have organized uh, service learning components that are, uh, we've, we've worked with uh, El Museo Latino in creating uh, educational uh, materials. Uh, students in our class met with students from uh, some local high schools and, and through their research and their compilation 
you know, we've, we've had to learn the, the culture first before they can, you know, gather materials and gather, you know, uh, they did some video recordings and some uh, actual physical materials that helped create an educational, uh, they called it a music box uh, based on cultural differences in, in different types of music uh, throughout Latin American countries and as they've changed in the United States uh, to more, you know, uh, intercultural music forms. Uh, and it was, it was wonderful because it, it was, you know, both research driven, our, my students were doing the work, but then they had a product that was going to serve future students and future people who wanted to educate themselves more. So I'm, I, I have uh, long been looking for other ways to, to perhaps uh, take students and, and do uh, engagement projects that might be more aligned with my more recent interview survey based interests and uh, in the last couple of years uh, in the OYAS office we have talked about creating a, a, a class that would involve taking students throughout Nebraska on a sort of mini study at home type of study abroad thing and you know along with experiencing you know uh, the the education that comes with the travel also perhaps engaging in, in the act of, of uh, interviews and, and other collections of, of oral history data. And so that's something that's, that's definitely on my radar. And I, I know uh, Christiane is, is still hoping to, to have that advance forward. Too. I hope you are able to do that. Yeah. It's because you, you actually anticipated the question that I was gonna ask you, <laughs> which, is, which, is, um, which is good. I mean, which is, you know, how do you involve students in this work? Because I think, I think it's an incredible, incredible opportunity for students to be able to engage in this kind of work, because it's it's um, it's not esoteric in any way. It is it is dealing with real people and their real lives and their real problems and their real dreams and everything else that 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 would be involved in having conversation with people. So I I, I hope you able are able to develop that course so that more, more and more students have the opportunity to participate in that that kind of work because it's incredible. Thank you. Sure. So next, um, I want to bring in Dr. Brady DeSanti, who is the Associate Professor of uh, Religious Studies, and he is the Director of UNO's Native American Studies Program. So Brady, uh, recently you, you wrote me a message and you said, uh, I think, if I, I hope I got it right, 70% of Native peoples reside in urban areas and cities. And so what, why, why is that? And given that, what is the role of the Native American Studies at UNO as a metropolitan as a metropolitan university? Right. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Dave. It's it's good to be here. So uh, again, my name is Brady DeSanti, and I have a long history with UNO. I went here from '97 to 2002, and I've uh, been here since 2007. Uh, so as Dave said, in religious studies, and I'm the current director of the Native Studies Program, which was created in 1992 by Professor Emeritus Dale Stover from Religious Studies. And um, I think one of the important things to, to kind of catch people up to speed is that there's just a lack of Native history, Native studies taught from grade school through high school for the most part. I know I graduated high school in 1997. I took all the AP history courses and Native peoples weren't mentioned hardly at all. Um, I'm currently finishing up a book with a friend of mine that's in the blind peer review process called uh, Understanding and Teaching Native American History that is geared towards teachers uh, at high school and college on how to teach uh, these topics. Um, one of the findings was about 87% of state history standards at the high school level don't mention Native American history after 1900. Okay, so that's a huge problem. And so what I have found, and I know other teachers within our program have found too, is that when you talk about something like the Dakota Access Pipeline, okay, in 2016, that really got a, a lot of media attention, you're found with the situation where people are interested in Native history and topics, but they have no basis or frame of reference, like there are for a lot of other issues. So you find yourself having to, in order to talk about a contemporary topic, give a sort of mini 20 minute uh, version of intro to Native American studies. Uh, so the more people are aware of these issues, hopefully you don't really have to do that. So what David said 
yeah, you have about 70, sometimes a little higher uh, numbers of native people, 70 to 72% living predominantly in urban uh, areas and, and cities. One way of looking at that would be to see that there is a political and legal relationship between tribal nations and the United States federal government. Uh, sometimes that's spoken of on a government to government basis and what sort of hinges that relationship are treaties or these contracts. Um, and so you can look at what reservations are, uh, I suppose, in a, a sort of Cliff Notes version is that these are the once large remnants of, of once large native uh, homelands that had been reduced through these treaty negotiations. We know that those were oftentimes forced upon tribal nations with all of the, the ensuing social ills and so forth that, that, that were a consequence. So that relationship, uh, the treaties, you know, the government uh, is supposed to abide by these uh, sorts of arrangements and certain obligations, healthcare, Indian health services, and, and so forth. Well, from, I tell my students to think of this relationship as a kind of pendulum that goes back and forth. Uh, the government sometimes says, look, we're not going to abide by those obligations to you. We're going to embark upon policies of assimilation. And really, so you can break this down into about 1887 to about 1934, the wars are mostly over and there was the mantra of, quote, kill the Indian, save the man, which was uh, a call to assimilation. Um, and it, it's one of the darkest times in, in Native uh, people's history, the boarding schools or residential schools, as they're called in Canada, uh, the crackdown in 1891 on, on Native spiritual traditions uh, were outlawed. And, um, and so you had a lot of the reservations reduced through something called the allotment or the Dawes Act and so forth. And so in 1934, one way of understanding that period is of course, we're in the midst of the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt had a new deal for the government, uh, federal expansion to try and get us out of that uh, economic uh, catastrophe. Well, he also had what he called his Indian New Deal or reorganiza Indian Reorganization Act, which again, the pendulum went from assimilation to one that would sort of nominally respect self-determination, uh, you know, native control over their destinies. It allowed them to reform their governments. It, it sort of lifted the ban on, on native religious traditions. But of course, you have a small window of time. And of course, after World War II, from about 1948 to 1970, the pendulum shifted once again to assimilation. This is a time that is called termination relocation. And without getting too deep into the weeds there, the, the termination aspect was the government once again targeting certain tribal nations where they would no longer abide by those treaty obligations. And along with that, they encouraged native families to relocate from reservations to designated relocation cities, places like Chicago, New York City, LA, I think Phoenix was one of them. Omaha was never designated as a relocation city, although you have about 15 to 17,000 native peoples in Omaha. Uh, so it, it does with about 150 to 170 different tribal nations represented. So long story short, that's really the reason is the post-World War II policy is where you get so many native peoples in the cities and so forth. And so UNO has always seen our mission as you know, we have relationships with the, uh, with the, the uh, Ho-Chunk or the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, Omaha, pa Ponca, uh, certainly we have a close relationship, and to an extent, Santee. Um, and so we have those relationships, but we've always tried to, to uh, meet the needs of our native students here in you know, the metropolitan area. And I think that one way that I have approached the mission and I inherit these teachings from previous directors and so forth, is that we're more than just an academic discipline. We do see ourselves as a community. And that's one of the, the uh, promises that, that I've made to our students is that we will do all we can to continue having native representation, both with our office associate and with our faculty who teach classes. Uh, and we work closely with the Intertribal Student Council uh, student group here on campus. And we really try and make our community feel like they're welcome and there are courses and that we're responsive to their needs and so forth. And despite COVID uh, and so forth, I think that we have maintained a positive momentum in that direction. And you have brought, we have with uh, you today, Gary Saul, who is a, a student in your program and is native himself, correct? 
Correct. Yeah. And that's probably a good, you know, you're probably tired of hearing uh, from me here. So I, yeah, Gary Saul is the office associate as of last December. He, his uh, assistance has been invaluable. You know, this is my second year as director and, you know, times are hard for everybody. And for Native Studies, we, we had kind of a, a difficult time here. And Gary, uh, his, his uh, professionalism and his ability to really work with the students uh, and the community has just been, you know, it's, it's been very important and so forth. So I'm going to turn it uh, over to Gary and let him kind of talk about the, the student aspects. Thank you, Brady. Uh, thank you, Brittany, for that uh, introduction. And also, I uh, just wanted to say thank you, uh, Dean Booker, uh, for the invitation and inviting uh, you know students to participate in this as well. I think that's an incredibly important move. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, but yep, yeah, my name is uh, Gary Saul. I am Sichangu Lakota. I'm also uh, Omaha and Ho-Chunk. Uh, as Brady said, I'm, uh, I'm the um, office associate currently in Native American Studies. I'm uh, also a student here at UNO. Uh, my major is interdisciplinary studies uh, and I'm also a minor in Native American studies as well. Um, and I'm also involved with Intertribal Student Council. I am the current treasurer um, uh, as of right now. And uh, so a lot of what a lot of what I do uh, with Intertribals, I'd, I'd really just like to talk about what I do with Intertribal kind of uh, at large. Um, Intertribal Student Council is the only uh, Native, as of right now, is the only Native American student group on campus. Um, <laughs> I believe it was founded, um, if I'm not mistaken, and Brady, you can correct me here, 1991, possibly, uh, I believe. Uh, but it, so it, or maybe 1995, but it was in, it was in the 90s. It's been around for some time. Uh, my involvement with Intertribal Student Council really didn't begin in, until, uh, until last year. Uh, but one thing I would really like to stress uh, and kind of and relate to um, with what Brady had covered about a large number of Native populations being urban, there is also still a significant number of us that come from reservations. I'm an urban Native myself. Um, now, even though there are some differences between uh, Native, uh, you know, reservation Natives uh, that grew up on reservations and then urban Natives like myself, there are some uh, fundamental similarities and some of the social issues that we experience, um, even though they may be manifest differently, are very similar in how they're uh, experienced. Uh, so when I came to UNO in, uh, originally in 2014, um, to be completely honest, I was entirely lost. Uh, I felt uh, sort of alienated, uh, sort of from the academic process, um, not just from uh, a lack of familiarity, but just sort of feeling as though it was something that, uh, that just really wasn't wasn't for me in a lot of ways. And that I think is a common experience for a lot of Native American students is that there's this feeling of, uh, of kind of alienation or uh, dissociation some, in some ways from the academic process. Uh, for even though, even though um, it's certainly been possible for Native American people to earn uh, you know, degrees and educations and in, uh, in, in, in education, um, you know, it really hasn't been within I would say the last 50 or so years that that has been something that has been uh, realistically sort of attainable and accessible to most Native people. Uh, so in, Intertribal Student Council has been, uh, has been sort of a, a kind of a home away from home. Even though I live in Omaha, um, uh, coming to the university again, like I said, it, it felt sort of uh, kind of like a, a little um, uh, unhomelike in a lot of ways. And Intertribal Student Council being able to see those familiar faces and people that think like me and talk like me and uh, and sort of have kind of a common shared experience as I do, similar to myself, has, is really what anchored me into uh, remaining in school. I left for a time in 2016 and I came back in 2019. And since I've come back in 2019, the, the difference between the success that I've had now and sort of the flailing that happened before during my first two years has really honestly been my involvement with our tribal student council and my involvement with Native American studies. Um, and <clears throat> part of the, an, another thing that I would like to turn to as well is the aspect that uh, about interacting with Intertribal Student Council is again, that familiarity. Um, and once, uh, you know, and I took, I think I took an intro course uh, to Native American studies in 2014. Uh, and even for myself, a lot of these things, uh, being a Native person myself, I, I was completely ignorant. Uh, to some of the the history and policies and things like that that were affecting, um, you know, having an effect on uh, not just me as an individual, but my family and my community. 
And so it really, those classes really kind of gave uh, body and volume to the experiences I had and, and, a, and a tangible way for me to relate to them in some way, to understand them. And <clears throat> so talking to some of my other, uh, you know, some of, some of my um, fellow students in our tribal student council, uh, it has become, uh, it just kind of toxic, talking amongst ourselves, it has become a pressing issue that we have uh, representation within the Native American Studies program uh, for the same reasons um, that it's important that we have that representation in our student groups and our student organizations. So again, it's about having Native American people teaching Native American Studies courses within the Native American Studies program that reflects us and that talks about those issues. Um, and and this, is a, this is, of course, a continuing endeavor and a continuing issue. Um, that you know that our that our students would uh, like to see um, you know to be see further furthered in advance as time wears on, and um, so there have UNO has certainly made some uh, tremendous uh, efforts and met us halfway on a lot of things. Uh, just this last semester, a really enormous victory for Native students here on campus is uh, that there was a uh, continuous exemption policy that was made for Native American students to be able to smudge in their dorm rooms. So if you're not familiar, smudging is the ceremonial burning of things like cedar, sage, or sweetgrass uh, to purify oneself uh, spiritually. Um, and this was something that Native students, because of course, you know, for safety reasons, uh, the fire policies in the dorm rooms, Native students weren't able to do. Um, so we had actually met with uh, Dr. Pettit and, uh, and Dr. Ship. Um, about these in a series of talks to basically um, arrange and hash out, uh, like I said, a continuous exemption policy so Native students could live out our spirituality in their in their dorm rooms and again make them feel more at home, and uh, and that that uh, was something that was concluded over the summer months and we're actually just now sort of kind of finalizing, um, and those sorts of things are like I said enormous victories for Native students um, going forward. But there are still many other things that we can uh, that that we can do. And just to kind of wrap it up here, um, right now working with Intertribal Student Council, um, what we've been putting together, or kind of been working on, and hoping to see uh, coming in the coming months is a sort of a, as a, a community alliance. As of right now, we're referring to it as an Indigenous Student Community Alliance. And what we'd really like to see, and this is in collaboration with student government, um, what we'd really like to see at some point in time is for there to be a um, uh, a kind of a table talk sort of uh, s sort of kind of town hall style, so to speak, where Native American students and members of the Native community, uh, such as uh, maybe even some Native nonprofit organizations, can meet with members of the um, administration here at UNO to voice some of the concerns that are facing Native students here on campus. And so those are some of some of the kind of plans that we have in the future um, to foster Native scholarship. So uh, thank you for the time. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of students. And I'm glad that Native, the Native, Native American Studies program was able to bring you back and, and create a good home for you. And um, you're doing great work. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Dr. Kerry Ryan, who's a professor of industrial organization psychology who supervised a project of doctoral students that recently presented uh, their results, uh, their findings at the, on DEI at uh, the Omaha Chamber of Commerce's commitment to opportunity, diversity, and equity. So Carrie, please explain this work, how it came about, and I know you've brought one of the outstanding students with you today. I have indeed, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this got started, uh, well, first of all, my area of interest is uh, stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination, diversity. And in the uh, industrial organizational psychology program, um, I focus on diversity in organizations. <coughs> um, that hasn't been a big topic in industrial organizational psychology, but it is becoming one <laughs> as our society becomes more diverse. Um, in any case, uh, so I taught a, a, a graduate course, Diversity in Organizations, about two and a half years ago. It was the first time I taught it. Um, very, uh, it was, I enjoyed it a great deal. So we read the academic literature um, relevant to diversity in organizations, and we're talking about all kinds of diversity. So uh, women, um, uh, various ethnic groups, um, LGBTQ, 
um, all kinds of, uh, so, you know, it was sort of a sampling across, although in some areas there's not very much research. It's quite surprising. Um, anyway, uh, I, one of the things I wanted to do was to connect with the community and connect the students with the community. What's going on? Um, what are organizations actually doing? And so uh, we had a few, we had a couple of guest speakers, and then we also went to Mutual of Omaha for one of their training sessions, just to, again, to see what actually is going on in the community. Um, we had, uh, um, one of our uh, guest speakers was uh, Bianca Harley from the Omaha Chamber. Um, and uh, she was at that time just been hired for this new initiative that the Omaha Chamber wanted to uh, sponsor in, with community groups um, called CODE, Commitment to Opportunity, Diversity and Equity. Right, I have it right, Laura? <laughs> I always just say CODE. So anyway, um, the, she was just getting started. Uh, they asked us to review some assessments because they wanted the organizations are going to sign on to this code initiative, local metropolitan, uh, Omaha metropolitan organizations. And one of the um, commitments they make is to assess their diversity, uh, their DEI initiatives. Um, and uh, so they were looking for assessments uh, the assessments that exist are quite expensive, some of them, and I don't know what the quality is because they're proprietary, so we can't really take a look at them. Um, but I have some, I have some guesses, <laughs> and uh, others just were they just were not well done. Um, to be very blunt about it, so uh, we agreed um, to go to develop a, a, a assessment for local organizations. And I had, we had several students working on this, both graduate and undergraduate um, students who participated in this whole project. So it's been, you know, oh, uh, two years, over two years. Okay. And uh, anyway, so Laura Brooks Doolin is a um, doctoral student in IO psychology. She'll be graduating in the near future. <laughs> and uh, she and one other student, uh, Emily, um, Adams uh, are both doing their dissertations um, on the code project, different uh, takes on it. And uh, they have also formed, they're the co-founders of Inclusion Analytics. And so they're gonna continue their work um, after they graduate. But I'm gonna let Laura now uh, talk about um, uh, the code initiative and our role in it. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Booker, and thank you to all of the panelists. Nothing amps up a student's imposter syndrome like following such great research. So it's been really <laughs> great to hear from all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, so like Carrie said, we have been working on the code initiative assessment for about two years now. We've gone through a pilot assessment that was in January of 2020. And we are just wrapping up the first administration. All of the organization reports are going out this month and we um, are currently working on the larger regional report. So when we started planning how we wanted to approach the creation of this assessment, we really wanted to focus on two key pieces. We wanted to make sure that we were measuring the organization level as well as the employee level because the intended practices from an organization doesn't always match the actual practices, then those actual practices don't actually always match the employee perceptions of those practices, and those perceptions don't always match the reactions. So we wanted to make sure that we were approaching this assessment from all angles. And um, so we had two assessments, one from the organizational side, one individual from the organization filled that out, and that was targeting nine areas of HR. So do you have a vision mission statement, value statement for your DEI? Um, what are your talent management practices around that? And how do all of these things interact to create an employee experience? We had about 40 organizations participate and over 6,500 employees. So we have a lot of really rich data to work with which is very exciting. We also added in two additional areas. 
we wanted to understand how the social justice movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, have been affecting organizations and employee experiences as well as COVID-19. So our organizations in general come from all realms of nonprofit, privately owned, publicly traded. We have industries that are faith-based, agriculture, banking, um, and going from sole proprietor to about 7,000 employees. So a lot of really diverse organizations in general. And our employees who actually participated were fairly diverse as well, though the majority were white at about 68% and about 74% were heterosexual. We did have a pretty even mix of men and women, but um, our gender minority category was fairly small and that includes uh, those individuals who identify as transgender, non-binary, um, gender non-conforming, all in that. Um, so just to touch on some of our results, what we found was that overall, our organizations in Omaha that participated are not representative of the Omaha population in terms of race and ethnicity. There are far more white individuals in our organizations than what our population in Omaha would suggest. And when you break that up by level, those who are white overrepresent the higher levels of the organization. So the board, executives, and managers. This was also true for women. So even though women represented about 65% of individual contributors, they tended to represent only about 38% of executives. So there's really that barrier for both women and people of color. When looking at the um, experience data, what we're seeing along four dimensions of experience, that is belonging, exclusion, fairness, and um, psychological safety. Overall, employees are having pretty positive experiences. However, when you break that up by, based on those demographics, we see that white employees and those who identify as Asian Americans are having much more positive experiences than other groups like Blacks, Latinx individuals, um, Native Americans. We're seeing that they are experience a lot less positive experiences as well as much more of those negative experiences like exclusion. And so what we're seeing here is that we're, we're really looking at a baseline. We have a lot of organizations who have jumped on board and it's really great that we've been able to measure this baseline and see where those organizations are at so that we can help them to improve, see where there are some gaps in their practices and really help them to notice where their intentions may not fully be um, interacting with those actual perceptions. That's amazing work. I, I will uh, commend you. I want to ch uh, challenge one of the, the where you started, which is, you know, no reason for you to feel any imposter syndrome. I think I'm the one who should feel the imposter syndrome after sitting here and listening to this in incredible panel for the last hour and all the incredible information and incredible work that all of you are doing on behalf of our students and including our students and it's it's a uh, it's a privilege for me to to work with all of you um, we do we are we are running out of time but we do have a question you know that i think we should address is has the pandemic affected your offices and you know and is there anything that i can do or you know the university can do to help uh, with your work Well, certainly it's a challenge to stay connected. <laughs> you don't run into people in the hallway and have a off the cuff right. conversation that leads to a whole new research project. <laughs> and so uh, uh, in terms of, I, I think UNO has been very supportive, um, uh, but I know uh, we, all, we all have to make ef extra efforts to connect with our students um, and it's, it's more effortful and uh, that's not, you know, that's just the way it is. I don't. Yeah. So much of what all you have been talking about have involved, uh, there's so much social dimension to what you're doing that the, the pandemic clearly is, would, if you hadn't already done some of this work already, you probably would have some difficulty 
doing it at this point. And um, um, so I, uh, I hope that we have an opportunity one day to have a conversation where we don't have to keep the pandemic in the, in the forefront of our minds all the time. I'll just, uh, I was going to say hello to that question. Um, and then uh, the idea, a lot of, you know, native interactions, we, you know, the kind of customary that have the personal connection. So having people in the office and, and so forth. So it has been challenging in that component, but uh, I believe Gary and I and, and the program have kind of turned that to almost an advantage. We have been able to reach, you know, using social media and it's easier to involve people once you get the hang of it in meetings and gatherings to an extent, you know, because a lot of times you have to make those arrangements to go to campus. So it has been difficult. Uh, like I said, cultural protocol is to be very personal in person when you can, but uh, we have, uh, I think we've met the challenge head on. Thank you. So for those of you who have, who have joined us today, I know that, that the, most of you are still hanging in with us. I really appreciate your joining us. This, will, this has been recorded and it will be posted on the website. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the incredible panelists that I've had uh, joining me today. Our next seminar will be held on Wednesday, December 9th, and will focus on the art of Samuel Bach and include the artist himself in the conversation. So thank you very much um, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>